Hi, I'm Dr. Melanie Joy. I'm the author of Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows, An Introduction to Carnism. And I'm also a professor at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. I teach sociology and psychology. What is carnism? Well, the best way to answer this question is with an example. Imagine that you're a guest at a dinner party and your host serves you a delicious beef stew. In fact, you find it so delicious that you ask the host for her recipe. And flattered, she replies that the secret is in the meat. You need to start out with three pounds of extra lean golden retriever. Your response to that comment is an example of carnism. Carnism is the invisible belief system that conditions us to eat certain animals. We tend to believe that it's only vegans and vegetarians who bring their beliefs to the dinner table. But when eating animals is not a necessity for survival, as in the case of much of the world today, then it is a choice. And choices always stem from beliefs. Why is it important to understand carnism? When it comes to some of the most important and frequent choices that we make, our food choices, there is a gap in our consciousness. In other words, we don't make the conscious connection between the meat on our plate and the living being it once was. And carnism is the invisible system that creates this gap in our consciousness. Carnism disconnects us from the truth of our psychological experience. In other words, carnism teaches us how not to feel. Carnism guides our food choices like an invisible hand, and it encourages, it encourages us to make choices that are against our core values, against our own interests, and against the interests of others. We can't make our choices freely until we step outside of the carnistic system. When we're born into the system that is carnism, we learn to see the world through the lens of carnism. And until we're aware of the system, the ways in which it's influenced our values, our preferences, our choices, our feelings, and our thoughts, then we really can't make our choices freely because without awareness, there is no free choice. What are the carnistic defenses I discuss in my book? Well, most people care about animals and don't want them to suffer, especially when that suffering is so intensive and so completely unnecessary. And yet most people also eat animals, often multiple times a day. So systems such as carnism, whose tenets, that's their teachings and um, practices, run counter to core human values, values such as compassion and justice and authenticity, um, need to use a set of social and psychological defense mechanisms to enable humane people to participate in inhumane practices without realizing what they're doing. The primary defense of carnism is denial. If we deny there's a problem in the first place, then we don't have to do anything about it. And the primary way denial is expressed is through invisibility. The way carnism remains invisible is by remaining unnamed. If we don't name it, we can't talk about it. And if we can't talk about it, we can't question it and we can't challenge it. The invisibility of carnism is why eating animals appears to be a given rather than a choice. But carnism also keeps its victims out of sight and therefore conveniently out of public consciousness. And carnism is a system of victimization. It victimizes all of us in different ways. Now, carnism also uses a set of defenses um, that help us justify eating animals. Um, and they're, the way that we learn to justify eating animals is by learning to believe that the myths of meat are the facts of meat. Now, there's a vast mythology surrounding eating animals, but all of these myths fall in one way or another under what I refer to as the three ends of justification. Eating meat is normal, natural, and necessary. And not surprisingly, these same arguments have been used to justify violent ideologies throughout the course of human history. Carnism also uses a set of cognitive defenses that distort our perceptions of meat and the animals we eat so that we can feel comfortable enough to consume them. So for example, carnism teaches us to see animals as objects. So we refer to the turkey on our plate as something rather than someone. Carnism teaches us to see animals as abstractions, as lacking in any individuality, any personality of their own, and instead simply as abstract members of a generalized group about which we've made stereotypical assumptions. A pig is a pig, and all pigs are the same. And like other victims of violent ideologies, we give them numbers rather than names. And carnism teaches us to place animals in rigid categories in our minds so that we can carry out very different behaviors and harbor very different feelings toward different species. So we can love our dogs while we 
eat pigs and not even recognize the inconsistencies in our attitudes and behaviors toward these animals. What led me to discover that there's a belief system in regard to eating animals? Well, I um, had grown up eating meat for, for much of my life and I had an experience um, it, which encouraged me to stop eating meat and um, once I stopped eating meat I had a shift of consciousness. Um, I started to see the world in a, in a very different way and at least my relationship to food and animals in a very different way and this led me to become very curious about what had happened for me, how it had been possible for me to see the same things so differently once I stopped eating animals. And I became curious enough that I wanted to study the psychology of eating meat. And I um, entered a doctoral program in psychology, and I did my do doctoral dissertation on the psychology of eating meat. And for my dissertation, I interviewed um, butchers and meat cutters, people who had raised and killed their own animals for food, vegans, vegetarians, and meat eaters. And what I discovered was that there was much more to eating animals than simply individual attitudes and behaviors toward food and animals. I discovered that there was a broader social system that encouraged people, all of us, to think and feel and behave in very similar ways when it came to eating certain types of animals. How did I first become interested in this subject matter? Well, like many Americans, I grew up with a dog who I loved like a family member. And like most people, I also grew up eating meat, often multiple times a day. And I never thought about how strange it was that I could be petting my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other. A pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent and sensitive and conscious as my dog. Um, you know, I didn't think about the inconsistencies in my attitudes and behaviors toward these animals because when I was eating the pork chop, frankly, I didn't actually think I was eating an animal. I mean, sure, I knew on one level that whenever I ate meat, someone had to die for my plate, but on another level, I just didn't connect the dots. So I had that knowing without knowing. There was a, a gap in my consciousness. And in 1989, I ended up getting quite sick. Um, I um, ate uh, what, was, what turned out to be my very last hamburger, um, which had been contaminated with Campylobacter, the sister disease of Salmonella, and I was quite sick. And before that time, I had been increasingly uncomfortable with the idea of eating animals because I had witnessed on a handful of occasions the horrors of animal agriculture, but I hadn't been ready to take that information in, so my response had been, don't tell me that, you'll ruin my meal. But after I got sick, I really never wanted to touch another hamburger or any meat ever again, and, and I didn't, and something interesting happened. As I stopped eating animals, I made the connection, like that gap in my consciousness closed, and I became very interested in the truth about animal agriculture, and I started learning everything that I could about it. And the more I learned, the more I felt that I wanted to be a part of the solution, and I wanted to raise awareness to try to work toward a more compassionate world for all animals, humans and non-humans alike. Am I saying there's really no difference between a pig and a dog? Of course there's a difference between a pig and a dog, just like there's a difference between me and my neighbor. I mean, for instance, pigs are more intelligent than dogs. That's one difference. But I think uh, more importantly for our consideration when we're talking about the ethics of how we treat animals is um, what do all animals have in common? not how are we different from one another. And what all animals have in common is sentience. It's the ability to feel pain and pleasure. It's the ability to experience suffering. We all have a life that matters to us, no matter whether we're a human, a pig, or a dog. And that, in my opinion, is um, the most important question that we can be asking. What do we have in common, not how are we different? What is one truth about the food industry that most people don't know? Well, contrary to what carnistic industry would have us believe, um, most of the animals that make it to our plates, mm. whose bodies make it to our plates, the animals don't. Okay. What is one truth about the food industry that most people don't know? 
Well, contrary to what carnistic industry would have us believe, um, the animals that make it to our plates are not raised on happy mom and pop farms. Over 99% of the meat, eggs, and dairy that make it to our plates come from animals who have been raised on factory farms in windowless sheds and remote locations that are virtually impossible for anyone outside of industry officials to obtain access to. These animals are crowded, often hundreds of thousands at a time, and often confined so tightly they can't walk, turn around, or even lie down. And they are routinely forcibly impregnated, castrated, they have their horns, tails, and beaks cut off, all without anesthesia. And these are standard industry practices, including in many free range and organic facilities. The reason that most of us don't know the truth about where our meat, eggs, and dairy comes from is because the horrors of standard industry practices are exactly why the industry works so hard to keep these animals out of our sight in the first place. A reader said that in my book I compare meat eaters with Nazis and racists. Nowhere in my book do I compare meat eaters with Nazis and racists. What I do do is look at the ways in which violent ideologies are structurally similar. So even though the experience of each set of victims of these ideologies will always be somewhat unique, the ideologies themselves are structurally similar in that the mentality that enables such violence is the same. It's the mentality of domination of sub and subjugation, of privilege and oppression. And I think it's essential that we pick out the common threads that are woven through all violent ideologies because otherwise we'll be doomed to recreate atrocities in new forms. We'll simply trade one form of oppression for another. So I have been very curious about how it is possible for humane people to participate in inhumane practices without realizing what they're doing. And that's what really led me to look at not the individuals, but the systems that have informed the beliefs and behaviors of the individuals. How is carnism a social justice issue? Understanding carnism helps us recognize that eating animals is not simply a matter of personal ethics, but the inevitable end result of a deeply entrenched oppressive belief system, an exploitive ism. A, a reader has asked how I would convince a meat eater to become a vegetarian or a vegan. Um, I don't try to convince people to do anything. My goal is to simply raise awareness about carnism so that people are better to make informed choices as consumers and become more empowered citizens. A reader has asked how I would argue with somebody who claims that humans evolved to eat meat. Um, and, and I wouldn't argue with somebody about this because I believe that this is an interesting question that's worthy of discussion, but I don't find arguments particularly productive. Um, I would say that um, there are many practices that are as long-lived and therefore as argu arguably as natural as eating animals, such as rape, infanticide, and murder. But we don't use the longevity of these practices as a justification for them today. It's also important to recognize that when we talk about um, something being natural, looking at something as a product of evolution, we tend to look at history through the lens of the dominant culture. When we live in a carnistic society, we look at history through the lens of carnism. We look not at human history, but at carnistic history. So when we ask the question about what is natural for humans to be doing, you know, we often reference our hunting ancestors rather than their fruitarian ancestors. We look only as far back in history as we need to to justify our current practices. And in the words of my friend and um, a wonderful author, Colleen Patrick Goudreau, do we really want to use the behavior of the Neanderthals as the yardstick by which we measure our current moral choices? I think we can do better than that. What is the difference between carnism and speciesism? Speciesism is the ideology in which we place animals in, or species in a moral hierarchy with humans at the top. Carnism is the ideology in which we are conditioned to consume certain animals within that hierarchy. We can think of carnism as a sub-ideology of speciesism, just as um, anti-Semitism, for instance, is a sub-ideology of racism.
why might somebody be comfortable hunting a deer but shy away from hunting a dog or a cat? Well, this is for the same reason that somebody might be comfortable eating a cow but uncomfortable eating a golden retriever or a kitten. It's because carnism informs the way that we think about and relate to the animals that we eat and often the animals that we kill in order to eat. Um, we're socialized within the system that is carnism to disconnect psychologically and emotionally from the truth of our experience when it comes to the select species that we have been taught to think of as edible. So what am I working on next? Um, I am currently on a national speaking tour, which has been um, generously funded by Farm Sanctuary, the nation's leading farmed animal protection organization, to speak to groups of people about carnism. I'm presenting a slideshow on carnism to raise awareness of the system. So how can we move beyond carnism to create a more compassionate world? Um, well, really, our caring about other animals is both the problem and the solution to the problem. Our caring is what makes us want to turn away and close our eyes and not bear witness to the atrocities that are happening to animals every minute of every day. But our caring is also what gives us the courage to see the truth, to, to bear witness. And so a fundamental part of moving beyond carnism is choosing to bear witness, choosing to be open to and learn about the truth of what happens to animals, to learn about the truth of animal agriculture, and to actively incorporate that truth into our analysis, especially for those of us that are working on other social justice issues, to, to recognize that carnism is a spoke on the wheel of these interlocking oppressions. So moving beyond carnism really requires that we open our not only our minds but also our hearts, that we actively seek out the truth and the information is out there for anybody who's interested in finding it. And not only that we seek out the truth but that we choose to act on that truth. One of the wonderful things about veganism is that it's possible to be an activist without doing anything except practicing peace on your plate. You can be a conscientious objector every time you sit down to a plate of food. So it's really essential that we commit to becoming informed, to becoming informed about the truth about animal agriculture, but also the truth about carnism, to learn as much about this system as possible so that we can step outside of the carnistic box and make choices that reflect what we truly believe and who we truly are, rather than what we've been taught to believe and how we've been taught to behave. How can people learn more about carnism? At carnism.com there is a plethora of information and my book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows, An Introduction to Carnism, um, really goes over this issue in, um, in depth. What do I like to talk about at speaking engagements? Well, I speak at a variety of venues um, and I have a slideshow that is an ex more of an experience than a lecture, um, which is designed to raise awareness about carnism. And I also have a presentation that I give to activists and advocates that are working to create a better world for animals to help empower them to do the important work that they're already doing more effectively. Thank you all so much for your um, very thought-provoking questions and for taking the time to listen. If you're interested in learning more about my work and my book, uh, you can visit www.carnism.com, my website, uh, melaniejoy.org, and you can find my book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows, in bookstores on Amazon, and it's also in Kindle.